Mr Mooney. My lady, I appear for this matter together with Miss Nelson and Miss Frager and Mr Sode appear for the respondent. Yes. Permission for the second appeal was granted by Lord Justice Mayles on the 1st of November 2021 and you'll see his permission document at page 73 of the court. Yes. The appeal concerns CPR 7.62A and a judge's discretion in granting extension of time for service of a claim form. We appeal Mr Justice Baker's decision of the 16th of July 2021 to overturn Registrar Davison's decision of the 26th of February 21. That decision was given at the end of the hearing, was it immediately? Yes. It was so how long did the hearing last, out of interest? Uh, I wasn't present. I'll turn yeah, my Ms. Nelson can yeah. tell us. Half a day. Half a day. And judgment immediately? Yes. I see, thank you. You'll note that at the end of his judgment, he, he's, he's dealing with costs because he ran out of time. Yeah. I assume I had a particular time estimate. And, uh, it's the appellant's case that the judge was wrong to overturn Registrar Davison's um, decision. He wrongly substituted his own view of the case for that of Registrar, uh, and it was entirely wrong to, to find that the Registrar had exceeded his generous discretion in finding what he found. I'm pleased to report, uh, as far as the bar is concerned anyway, the law in this case is agreed, and you will have seen that both the Registrar and the um, judge set out the law in very similar ways, and the judge agreed what the registrar had said about the law. Uh, the, the judge said there was no no legal misdirection. I, indeed. This, I, I, this is a no reasonable master could Absolutely. have Absolutely, this is outside the, the bounds yeah. of reasonable discretion. Yeah. Um, as you'll be well aware, the court will apply the overriding objective when considering the application of CPR 7.62a, albeit with the guidance of uh, Lord Justice Dyson, as he then was, and his comments in the case of Hashtrudy of Hancock, 2004, neutral citation, EWCA, Civ 652. Uh, and if it's helpful, I'll turn to that now yep. at the authorities bundle, page one. And perhaps the most relevant paragraph for our purposes, paragraph 18 on page six. Uh, and to put it in context, the discussions being between the difference between 7.63, which is a much more onerous position when you're asking for permission to extend after the time of the, the life of the, of the claim form, and 7.62 when you are not. Yeah. Uh, and I, I pick up the commentary at third line down. We have no doubt that it will always be relevant for the court to determine and evaluate the reason why the claimant did not serve the claim form within the specified period. This has nothing to do with the fact that under the former procedural code, the threshold requirement is that the plaintiff should show good reason. It is because the overriding objective is that of, that of enabling the court to deal with cases justly. It is not possible to deal with an application or extension of time from CPR 7.62 justly without knowing why the claimant has failed to serve the claim form within the specified period. So that is the uh, agreed position of what both judges, or particularly the, the registrar of first instance, was looking at. And we submit on behalf of the appellant that this case, this appeal, really boils down to one question. And that is this question. Was it open to the registrar to find the difficulties that the claimant faced in service in August 2020, 2020 amounted to a good reason for the claimant to fail to serve the claimant? Middling good. Good enough. Yes. Yeah. And that we submit. I mean, looking at the authorities, you're, you're absolutely right about Hashtrudy. There are um, other authorities which say, as a matter of general principle, in the absence of a good reason, uh, an extension is unlikely um, to be granted, but there's still a discretion to grant Indeed, it. Indeed. But it is all about the reason. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and, that, and the master said as much at paragraph seven, because the master said the starting point is first to evaluate the reason. Absolutely. The reason I say the appeal boils down, as I say it does, to that single question is because it's quite apparent from the grounds of appeal that the respondent relied upon when getting permission and then, 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 then winning their appeal uh, went straight, or the grounds, particularly grounds one and two, which I'll turn to in a moment, went straight to the, to the reason itself. 
And I'll just turn that up, if I may, which is the judgment of uh, Mr Justice Baker, which can be found at page 25 of the core bundle. We'll see over the page at page 26, he sets out the grounds that he gave permission on. There were six grounds in total. Ground six is the wrap-up ground that, 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 that um, ex exceeded the, the wide, uh, the general discretion. Um, but it's grounds one to three you gave permission on. One and two are the important ones, I submit, because uh, at one, the learned registrar did not give sufficient weight to the, the claimants had not made any attempt to serve the claim for within the first five months after its issue. And that's the point that Mr Justice Baker deals with very firmly within yeah. the what is or is not a good reason. And secondly, the learning registrar did not give sufficient weight to the fact that the claimant could have served the claim form within its lifetime, but chose to do so on the ground of expense. And that's all picked up in his wording later, isn't it? Indeed. It's choice, 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 choice. Choice not to serve. Yes. But, uh, but, but, but just looking at that, that's, um, that was not what was argued. What was argued was that it was perverse, that there was no... Um, it, it wasn't a question of weight. It was a perversity appeal. Weight yeah. is a matter for the for the master. Yes, and, but, and in fairness to Mr. Justice Baker, he, he says that um, it was a perverse decision. Yeah, yeah. He had to. He had yes. to, did he? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the reason I say that, that one question identified at the beginning is because if you look at ground three, ground three deals with the fact that we were, there was a limitation defence available at this stage. Yeah. Of course, permission was only given on that ground on the basis that grounds one and two yeah. had good prospects of success. And at the end of his judgment, when looking at ground three, Mr Justice Baker um, tells us that at page 36, that without their bit, sorry, in the absence of a good reason, ground three is made out. Yes. But if he was wrong about that effectively, and if the registrar was right, then ground three wouldn't be made out. Yeah. So it seems to me that that falls away as far as uh, our purpose is concerned. It matters whether or not it was open to the registrar to find that there was a good reason, or, or a middling good reason. What were four crowns four and five out of interest? Doesn't matter. I, I have to confess, <laughs> I don't know. Don't worry, please, leave it. Yes. <laughs> Call me out, my lady. Um, so we then come to, well, what did the registrar find in this case? What, how did he come to the conclusion that he reached? <clears throat> Um, may I turn, first of all, to the chronology, and I'll, I'll do this briefly, because I know that you'll be fully aware of the course of events in this case. The chronology is at page 21 of the core bundle. Yeah. It's perhaps helpful just to remind ourselves of what the registrar was looking at when he came to consider this case. We can see the timescales, um, those that help the claim and those that don't, and I, I'm fully uh, aware of that. We'll see at page 21 that the tort is allegedly committed on the, in March 2018. Claim form issued, it's an Athens Convention case, claim form issued um, a month before the expiry limitation. Yeah. Uh, the next important dates, perhaps, because um, it, it's when action, action what, and one of the criticisms of the uh, appellant in this case is lack of action, is that the, cop the, the claim form a copy of the claim form is sent to defendants for information purposes. Just going back a step, if you would, Mr Mooney, the, but we know there's some pre-action correspondence, December 2019, response denying liability. Yes. What was the basis of the denial of liability? Uh, the, 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 the basis of, of, the li of denying liability was that it was not foreseeable that the other passenger uh, would A, break in and B, do what he did. And the so other basis was on the basis that given that the claimant was asleep, it couldn't have been a sexual assault. Mm. And and that the, I'm, forgive me if I'm, I'm harking back to a defence I've seen some time ago, I'm not involved in the lower courts, but um, from memory also the defence was put that because the defendant was drunk, I see. he didn't have the mens rea to commit a sexual assault because he couldn't remember the way he was doing it. That's, 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 that's what's what's that got to do with the civil claim? Well, that's, that's what's put in the end. Um, right. Um, the... Cabin door lock was admitted to be faulty, apparently. Yes. That was in the, in the letter of response or in a subsequent email, I think. Subsequent I'm email. grateful, both. 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 Thank you. 
-hmm. That was in the justification for refusing to give any further disclosure in relation to it. Yes. We then have um, the period in June 2020, so admittedly four months after the claim form was issued, when there are attempts by the appellant's solicitors to contact the defendant's solicitors and ask if they will accept service, all of which, all four attempts, went unanswered. Uh, and then we get to perhaps the... Sorry, sorry, just take you back. The 8th of April, uh, claim form sent for information purposes. Presumably that was, as it appears, a deliberate decision, because otherwise the time to service of particular claim would, would have been triggered and would have been required 14 days later. Yes, and you would have seen that there was an extension to the claim as well, uh, the service which came in this case as well, already granted by the registrar. Shall I say that again? There was already an application which had been granted for extension of service to the claim in this case. Yeah, not, 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 on the not at that April. stage. No, no, not no, on the 8th of April, no. that was down the line. And, and at that stage, there wasn't uh, yet the medical evidence? No, the medical evidence, there was a delay in getting the medical evidence, which then came faster than expected. Yeah. And from memory, yes. it was served in July yes. of 2020. Obtained in July. Obtained and then served. And then served. But, but at that stage, no medical evidence, so no, no clear idea about value? or The claim form said um, up to 15,000. Yeah. It was then amended when it was finally served to between 50 and 100,000. So I was taking you to the June period when the um, claimants, this was the right and defense, this is asking if they would accept service and not receiving a response, which then led to the July inquiry starting 23rd with the French service agency Portsea to try and serve overseas. And I won't take you through these emails in detail. This well, sorry, sorry to interrupt again. It, it, it looked from Ms McKenna's evidence as though in fact what triggered uh, going to Portsea was that, that the 23rd or the 22nd was when she managed to get hold of the pro foreign process unit. Yeah. Uh, and they explained the options and it wasn't, it wasn't simply that she'd waited uh, whatever it is, six weeks from the moment she'd asked for them to accept service. No. That's right. Sorry, I, I hadn't picked that up. Is that in Miss McKenna's statement? Yes. Can we just look at that? Please? Which is pages 35 to 100, uh, 35 of the supplemental bundle. Thank you. So para 41. Yes, it starts yeah, off. I contacted there. a number of 40, a number of process servers. Uh, 39. Uh, it's 30, it's 30, 39, yes, I think. Right. Yeah. It goes in the middle of the way. Yes. So, it, so it's coinc not coincidence as such, but the last request for service was the 22nd, and as it was, and in contact with Portsea on the 23rd. Yeah. Thank you. As I said, unless, unless you want me to go through it at length at this point, I won't, because of course it's set out in both judgments, but you can then see yeah. the train of correspondence between Portsea and the claimant solicitors, which ends in the say infamous perhaps in this case now, email of the 4th of August 2020, yeah. um, when Mr Warburton of Portsea reports, I'm sorry to tell you that all our efforts to get the service on the 14th have come to nothing. And we have the, we've asked, we've got the particular Housier uh, that was out of area has quoted a, a fee of £2,000. So that is the background that the registrar was faced with. Yeah. Uh, I now turn, if I may, to his, his judgment, which is again in the supplemental bundle, this time at page 233. Three. Three. So what did the registrar find uh, in relation to the reason? It, it's worth looking at his judgment as it, as it plays out in my special submission. He, he starts off with, with, with the background and talks about that he's dealing with three issues. Firstly, the insufficiently good reason to extend the time. Second, the, the duty of full and frank disclosure not being complied with. 
uh, or the allegations we complied with, and third, a point about the amended claim form, which we need concern Sorry, you're with. para one. Okay. End of para one. Page 234, paragraph one. Yes, thank you. He then goes on to set out the CPR, and at paragraphs three and four, he sets out the facts. Now, I pause there to note the length at which he sets out the email correspondence between Portsea and um, Ms. McKenna of the claimant solicitors. Because it is clear that, as far as he's concerned, that is an important feature of this case because he sets it out in full, every single email set out there, ending with, as I've described, the infamous email of the 4th of August, at the bottom of page 235. But Ms. Nelson can confirm, is it right that he would have been aware of the... You're, you're quite right, we, one can see what he thought was most important but he was aware of the full circumstances leading up to this exchange. He had Miss McKenna's yes. statement, yes. and submissions were made by reference to all of the evidence on the full chronology. Yes, thank you. Uh, and then he concludes the chronology and the evidence, as it were, with his uh, top of page 236. In light of that email, and that's the email of the 4th of August, um, Ms. Uh, Ms. McKenna made the application to extend the time for service for the claim form, which she did the very next day. And of course, he heard that ex parte the very next day. He then sets out the evidence that was attached to that application. Uh, and we then go to his views on the reason. And paragraph six is perhaps an important paragraph because he says this I turn then to the reason why the claim form could not be served in the prescribed time. Now, that word could comes back to haunt us in this case. Yeah. Um, but my respectful submission is when you look at this judgment as a whole, that word could does not have the import that the judge later places on it in his judgment. Yeah. Expand we, on that. What do you well, I, I say that because if we then look at what he goes on to say, he sets out... But what do you say he meant? I say that he was looking properly at the Ahash Trudy test so he was asking himself the question, why wasn't it served, not why couldn't it be served? Or was it going to be served, in fact? Yes. But all these cases, oddly, when you're dealing with a prospective application, talk about failures to serve, which is inapposite. Actually, what you're looking at is why it is not possible to serve within time. Of course. Rather than a, failure to, a, a past failure to have served. It's, of course, an irony in this case that had he refused permission on the um, 5th of August, there was still time to go yeah. back and pay the two thousand yeah. pounds. But, but um, so I, I say that when he says "could," what he what he meant there, and that and when, I went, when we look at the rest of his judgment, what he meant there was hadn't been to date and wasn't going to be. And um, you say the judge wasn't entitled to infer from that statement that he had already reached the conclusion. Yes. That this uh, well, when we come to look at uh, the judge's findings. I say he placed far too much weight on that on word, could. word could. Effectively uses the that could to say this was the wrong decision. Yeah. And the reason I say that you need to look at this judgment more holistically than simply the word could in paragraph 6 is because when we get to paragraph 7, we can see he sets out, without actually citing Hashtrudy, he sets out the Hashtrudy test. He sets out the appropriate way of looking at things. Uh, I pick up his paragraph 7 halfway down. Nevertheless, to quote from the commentary to Rule 7.62, the starting point of the defendant has a right to be sued, if at all, by means of a originating process, issued within the statutory period of limitation and served within the period of its initial validity, validity for service. It follows that any departure from that starting point does need to be justified. The approach to the authority is essentially first to evaluate the reason, and the better the reason, the more likely an order will be made or not set aside and second, to put that reason to the wider context, which includes consideration of the overriding objective and the balance of hardship to the parties. Now, in my submission, there is absolutely nothing wrong in, with, with, that, with that contention, and it is effectively Hashtrudy without citing Hashtrudy. I don't think anyone suggests otherwise. No. Given that he is a, that what he has said there, it's clear he has in mind the appropriate test, which isn't, was unable to serve, but hasn't served and isn't going to. And then I add to that submission, paragraph 8, where he set, starts off, difficulties with service of the claim for, form are undoubtedly capable of being a good reason. There is plenty of authority for that, 
and that was the situation here. So I submit that his finding on the facts was the, good, the reason, good, bad, or indifferent at that stage, was difficulties with service. Difficulties, not impossibilities. And if he had really meant could, he would have said the impossibility of service. So having identified the difficulties of service are, are the reason, if we look back to paragraph four, it's plain that those are the reasons that he is finding, those are the difficulties he's talking about. So we submit he must have had in mind that email of the 4th of August. And anybody reading the email of the 4th of August would understand that there were difficulties with service, but it was not impossible. You could pay the money. But it, um, it, it, we know, that because it, the 4th of August email is described as the crucial email. So the crucial, yes. the word crucial tells us... He had it that, fully front and centre of his mind. And there can't be a reading of that that says service was impossible. He then, having identified the reason, properly accepts that there's a problem for the claimant in this case, that they didn't start work on service abroad until fairly late in the piece. And it was only done three weeks before service. So he has in mind exactly what he's complained about in the grounds of appeal. He, he thinks about that and he says, well, that's right. And he finishes off that paragraph nine, but that fact does not trump every other. And it is relevant that in normal times, three weeks would have been sufficient, would have been a sufficient period. Now we know that because that's what Miss McKenna says in her evidence, and we know that from what the um, agent said in his emails. There's plenty of time for this, and it's something which the judge later accepted in his judgment that there was that, that, that three weeks would be enough time. So, what is being said there? The three-week period itself is not the problem. It's what then happens with the agent and the Hoosiers and in France that causes the problem. So this is different to those cases where effectively the reason appears to a defaulting party later on and they're able to latch onto it. This is, this is a case where there was still time, it was still appropriate, it was still, it was the, the, um, the claimant had not uh, dropped the ball to the extent that they were in, in difficulties already. They had time, things went wrong later in the piece. So it's the crucial email of 4th of August that changes the picture. Exactly. Uh, and then in paragraphs 10 and 11, he does the balancing exercise. He performs the overriding objective balancing exercise uh, and thinks carefully about the effect on both sides, thinks about the weight and the strength of the, um, of the reason. He describes it as a middling good. This is paragraph 11. It's middling good, but that's still a good reason. Then he thinks. Then he finds a balance of hardship in favour of the claimant. That's never been challenged. Uh, and goes on to say, uh, but and then I'll deal very briefly. I'm over this with this last point uh, that he's dealt with both in paragraphs ten and eleven. Mm. That he wasn't misled when he came to look at the application on the fifth of August, and there was no basis to say there wasn't full and frank disclosure. Those are findings he made, and we know from paragraph one they were that was the second of the issues that he was concerned with. So he, ha he has made findings. I wasn't misled, and there was no, there was no basis for this suggestion of failure to full and frankly disclose as is the duty next party uh, hearing. So it comes as something as a surprise when those issues were not appealed, but the judge then put so much store by them in his judgment that will come to a moment. And there's no respondent's notice here? No. So having identified what was found and where the judgment, where the registrar made his judgment, let's, if we may, now turn to the judgment on appeal of Mr Justice Baker, whose judgment I've again lost, but it's page 25 of the core bundle.
when we turn to, to that, there is, again, the detailed um, setting out of the correspondence. Um, but in reality, in my submission, the crux of his judgment in why the registrar fell outside his generous ambit uh, of discretion is set out in paragraphs 40 and 41, when he deals with grounds 1 and 2, page 35. Now, we can see, we remember, we remind ourselves what grounds one and two were. They are failed to give sufficient weight to the fact that the claimants had not made any attempt to serve the claim form in the first five months. And ground two failed to give sufficient weight to the fact that the claimant had not served the claim form within its lifetime, but chose to do so, but chose, could have done, but chose not to on the ground of cost. So those are the two matters he's particularly paying attention to here in grounds one and two. And he deals with them absolutely clearly as is this a good reason? So we look, we look at what he has to say. Reading the Admiralty Registrar's judgment fairly and not looking to find error, as is, of course, a proper approach, nonetheless, in my respectful view, he wrongfully treated this case as, a, as one in which, A, it had not been and was not going to be possible to serve the claim for in time when steps were finally taken with a view to serving it. Now, I pause there because we've already discussed this. And that's a reference to the could, is it? Yes. OK. A and we can... We can we can check that if we go back to paragraph 31, page 33. Yep. This is where it says, having summarised the facts, the Admiral Registrar at six turns, he put it, to the reason why the claim form could not be served in the prescribed time, which rather assumes the case be one of could not be rather than merely was not. Or was not going to be. So this is the basis upon which the registrar's decision is attacked, in that it is found by Mr. Spakers, ba Baker that the registrar had, had decided this was a case where the claim form could not be served. And for the reasons I've already set out, well, that simply isn't correct. Because he must have had the August the 4th email in mind, that there's only one reading that email, and he talked about difficulties rather than impossibilities in the judgment. And then he goes on, and B, there was a reason for not being able to serve it in time. That was inherently a good reason. Uh, and that, that's very much a connected point in that he goes on in paragraph 41 to say there was no reason why it could not be served. Well, we accept that's right. So we need to effectively go back and, and ask the question which the judge didn't, which is, well, if you look at the Hashtrudy reading and say it, it, it hadn't been and wasn't going to be, is there a good reason for that? Not is there a good reason for it couldn't, it couldn't be served. And he doesn't do that exercise because he attacks the judge on the basis of a finding which I submit the judge didn't actually make. Sorry, the registrar didn't make. And I say that because of paragraph 41. Considering the judgment as a whole, the Admiralty Registrar, registrar treated when, what, what Mr. Warburton reported to Mr. Kenner by his email on the 4th of August as a good reason why the claim form could not be served in time. Now, I, uh, and for the reasons I've already given, I said that's wrong. In my view, in a, he erred in both respects. On the evidence, it was not even a reason why the claim form could not be served in time, because the claim form could, could have been served in time, or at all events, it was not shown that it could not be, notwithstanding the report of Mr. Warden on the 4th of August. And then he goes on to the second part, and what I say really is the crux of this case. It was not a good reason, if it was any reason at all, because it was unreasonable to take no steps until three weeks prior to the expiry of the validity of the claim form towards affecting service in France. So really, we, we, we come down to that. If you take out his attack of the registrar on the registrar finding that it couldn't be served, if, you say, if, you, if you're with me that that is wrong, then the next question is, well, if the registrar didn't get that wrong and was thinking of this more as a wasn't and wasn't going to be rather than a couldn't and couldn't be, then you're asking the next question, well, if the registrar was thinking wasn't wasn't going to be, was there good reason why it wasn't going to be? Uh, and what the what the what the judge says about that is there wasn't good reason because they started too late. Is it just that, or is it that two thousand pounds in the grand scheme of things was not uh, something that should have prevented 
the uh, claimant solicitor from what? proceeding with that particular out of area PCA? Well, my, my, my lady, uh, that I accept that because at paragraph 36 on page 34, yeah. it does deal with that. He talks about it wasn't a particularly d difficult thing, it was just a matter, matter of expense. But on that point, what I say, what we submit is this. Expense must be the very essence of a matter of discretion. If this was 10,000 or 20,000 pounds, everyone would be accepting well, that's a ludicrous sum of money in this case. Of mm. course it was reasonable to ask the commission. If it was 200 pounds, you might be saying, well, it's more than it's expected. And we know how much it should be, because that's found in the evidence of the defendant solicitor in the supplementary bundle. Yeah. It should have been 48 euros. Yeah. But so 200, 500 pounds, you may all have said, well, that's not very much. But when you get into these grounds of 2,000, 3,000, that's surely the ultimate matter of discretion. Particularly if it's an, uh, not a very high value claim. Indeed, indeed. Some judges may feel that 2,000 isn't that much, and they should have gone on the surf. Others just may feel actually proportionality, uh, uh, other issues, it's entirely right to come to court and ask for an extension. And that is discretion. And, and there was an added feature to the to the cost issue because Mr. Warburton himself rejected that quote and said yes. no. So it would have required going back and reinstating that, and who knows what the position would have been. Indeed, I accept there's no evidence on what no. would have happened had no. he gone back and said no, Mr. Warburton, you must. Well, we know what he thought about it, yeah. don't we? Yeah. It's a colossal. Yes. And whatever else, colossal and something. Yes, he takes yeah. the view it's an yeah. unbelievable amount of money yeah. to ask. And it was nonsense to ask it. Now, that's a matter for him, I suppose. But um, the, point, the point I make is this is absolutely squarely in the bounds of discretion. But if, if allied to the discretion point on expense and going back to the other point that appears to be relied on, which is the three-week delay, you say that was the, something the registrar expressly considered and took into account? I, I do. And, and whilst I accept that... Other judges may say, if you don't start till three weeks before the expiry, you're in trouble. That is, again, a matter of discretion. Some judges will think, well, actually, given that we know that there was time to serve, given we know what uh, Mr Warburton said about that, given we know what Ms McKenna says about that, that was a reasonable decision to take. So two reasonable judges could have taken uh, I I I entirely conflicting decisions in relation to all these factors because they put different weight on one factor uh, than the other but still both be within their, the range of reasonable discretions in reaching a conclusion, either to extend or not to extend. My lady that's has distilled my submission better than I was managing. I'm very grateful. Yeah, I'm not sure I have, but... but that, that, that's, exa that's exactly the yeah. point. These are two discretionary positions. Yeah. Uh, and the only, the only point at which the judge is able to say the registrar is wrong is on that point about could. And if you read the the judgment, as I say, holistically, and the way it should be read, I, I submit, or we submit, then you get to a different conclusion, because as I say, he talks about difficulties, and he plainly has the email in mind. So, so that, is, that is, in essence, our case. Because if, if I mean, the judge got the structure right, didn't he? If he was entitled to make a finding of perversity, then it was open to him to consider it, consider it afresh. Yes. It's all about the gateway. Indeed. With, with a, if he was wrong about that, then he wasn't entitled to go on and re 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 carry out the exercise. Yes, again. and so I, I come back to where we started. The only question is, was there a middlingly good reason that the registrar was entitled to rely on? If there was, then it should never interfered. If there wasn't, well, then claim some difficulties. And you've already made the point in relation to limitation that although uh, the judge thought the master had dealt with it lightly, um, he didn't. He, he didn't say that that in itself was an error. Indeed, and I know that there are a number of authorities in in, the, in your your yes. uh, lordships and ladies, ladies from lordships um, bundle dealing with that very point. Yeah. I say it's actually irrelevant when you look at the judge's decision. Because he says, I'm not looking really at ground three until I get through the gateway of grounds one and two. And I wouldn't have found ground three on its, on its own. own. Yeah. I need to have found the judge was wrong about, the registrar was wrong about grounds one and two. Uh, and if you strip that away, 
limitation, while of course it's an important matter for the registrar to think about, which I submit he did, did in his judgment, um, it doesn't have anything to disappeal. Now I'll turn my back for just a moment. Uh, unless there's anything else I can deal with, that those are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Mooney, very clear. Yes, Ms Prager. Well, my lady, there is perhaps something between us after all in regards to the uh, relevant legal principles, therefore, because we say that limitation was very important and the fact that limitation had passed uh, and that the claim was issued only very shortly before limitation passed is an important factor in this case. Um, and you, you've got no respondent's notice in relation to ground three, have you? No, indeed. No. But we say that so. it is a factor which means that the decision which was made by the loan registrar did fall outside um, the reasonable range of uh, decisions. But you haven't got a respondent's notice? Uh, no, but it's... Well, that it's wasn't the judge's finding. Well, it's something that uh, failed to be considered by the registrar in looking at the the goodness of the reason, reason, if I can put it that way, because we say that it's not a good enough reason. But that wasn't the finding instances. of the judge. Um, well, well, my lady, how do you get that off the ground without a respondent's notice? Well, my lady, because it, whether or not something is a good reason for these purposes will depend on what the purposes are that we're looking at. And in this case, although limitation, although the learning registrar did say, well, I, I wasn't misled, it is a matter um, which. Uh, was not raised with him in the first instance. It is Sorry. a matter of... Let me ask reason. my question again. I'm not asking you what the argument is. I'm saying the judge whose decision is under appeal did not rely on the limitation point as a reason for interfering with uh, Master Davison's decision. You have not put in a respondent's notice to say that it would have been a different reason for upholding the decision of the judge. How can you now in this court argue this point without a respondent's notice? My lady, we say that whether it is good reason or not depends on the purpose for which it's being relied upon. Well, that's not exactly that's not what answer. the judge said. Look at paragraph 47. And it's not an answer to my question, Ms. Prager. Well, Lady, in that case, I will uh, go on to. Uh, I mean, just just so you, you know, my thought process. It's clear that the, the goodness of the reason, as you put it, is separate. It's a yes. separate issue. Yes. From the balancing, it from what then comes into the balancing yes. exercise, which is where limitation comes in. So it's got nothing to do with the goodness. Well, the judge certainly did not see them. Look at the last sentence of forty-seven. I would yes. not have been prepared to say he was not entitled to treat that, that good, good reason. reason. Yes, had right. there been one, yes. Right, so without a respondent's notice, you cannot challenge that. Do no. you accept no, that? No, no, I do accept that, of course. Right. Yes. So shall we start again? <laughs> yes, my lady. Um, looking at the judgment, uh, which is under appeal here, um, my lords and ladies will see that the judge took the correct approach in reminding himself that he was not entitled to disturb um, the findings of the judge, uh, and indeed that the judge had to be wrong in order for the appeal to succeed. And he found that he was wrong, um, and that the uh, claim form could have been served, or could be served at the time uh, that he made that decision, but that the claimant solicitors had decided not to do that. And he finds that that is not a good reason for not serving. And effectively, oh, well, that suggests he's not doing the right approach. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's exactly the opposite. What he should be doing is saying, "What did the master find? Was that reasonable? Was that sorry? Was that a conclusion open to him?" Yes, and he finds that it wasn't. It does because the master ought to have found um, that 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 wasn't a good reason. Because that was reason. the only possible conclusion anybody could reach. Yes. Right. So that's that's what you that's the tar the target you need to meet. It is. So it is. show us on what basis. <laughs> The judge was entitled to conclude that the master had been wrong to find there was a reason and wrong to find that it was a good reason. Well, if I take uh, you to the authorities bundle, if I may. Yep. And uh, you've been taken to Ashtrudy, but the analogy that the respondent draws 
is with the Cecil and Byatt case, which starts at page uh, 60 of the Dodge and Dunbar. Yeah. And this is a case where the claimant had effectively used up all their money on suing the defendant in America and had therefore waited until legal aid was in place until serving the claim form. And we say that that is an analogous situation with this one because for reasons of finance, the claim form had not been served. So we say that the analogy is, is apt in this case. Well, the decision in this case was that they hadn't used up all their money so far as being able to afford to actually serve the claim form in this case. No, indeed. So, actually it's so, that's, so that's what this case decides. Uh, essentially, they hadn't run out of money. They could have served the claim form and then, uh, and, and then addressed their shortage of funds, and that's what they should have done. Yes. So uh, how is that analogous with the case we're deciding? Because when, with reference to, to choices, financial-based choices, and that's what this case is about, because the, um, the learned judge, uh, Mr Andrew Baker, um, held that there was a choice here not to spend the money, not to spend £2,000. But, but it wasn't for him <laughs> to decide that. He, what he had to do, as you have said at the outset, was to look at what the master decided and uh, applying the test that you indicated was the right test, uh, evaluate whether that was a, a, a decision that was one that was open to him or one that no reasonable master on these facts could have reached. And we say that it, it wasn't. Well, why? Because the master ought to have found. But, but ought isn't good enough, is it? It's a no, it's perversity. Yes. That's it. It was perverse to find. But the no what? reasonable master could have found Why? that having left it to the last minute to issue, having then left it to the last minute to attempt to serve, and then having not given instructions with any degree of urgency to the agent who was serving in France, then to say, uh, I will not spend £2,000 on serving, was wrong, and no reasonable master could come to the conclusion that having done all of those things in that chain, which is what um, the judge below found, that that was an entirely unreasonable um, way to conduct oneself and to originate process. And no reasonable master could find that having delayed in issuing until the last moment... Let just, let's in, just take each sorry. of those stages. Master Davison recognised that there had been service at, at the 11th hour, uh, issuing well, at the 11th hour, yes. I'm so sorry, recognised that the limitation period had expired, recognised that there had been a delay until the 23rd of July and that that was not prudent, uh, and then regarded the 4th of August turn of events as crucial. Yes. But then that. came to what we say is the wrong conclusion. From having recognised all of those things, did not then make the determination which the respondent says he was forced to make, should have made, a reasonable master would make, having recognised all of those factors. In, in, I'm just unpicking it. Actually, yes, claim form was issued, I think, in February, wasn't it? Yes. But that was almost, well, very soon after... Aegis had been instructed in December 2019 and very shortly after um, the conclusion of pre-action protocol correspondence. Yes. But that's... That's context. It is context. This is not a case where nothing was happening. On the contrary. Well, it's a case where, on the claimant's side, whether it be the claimant or her solicitor, almost nothing happens for almost two years. And where the Athens Convention gives a two-year non-extendable limitation mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. So without needing to... Or well, do, we, do, we, do we know quite what was happening in those two years? I mean, we do know, for example, that a complaint was made at the time and was investigated. I don't know how long that went on. I don't know anything about that. Well, I mean, I'm not, sure we're, I'm not sure we're in a position to say, one, that the claimant did nothing about pursuing the claim no. for all of those two years. All we can say is that a letter of claim was sent in... Yeah. December of 2019. We, we do know, sorry to keep cutting across here, we do know that she made a complaint to the police about their failure to progress yes. her claim. I don't know where I picked that up from, but it's somewhere. Yes. So, it, so this is a police union funded process, is it? No. I, I don't understand. It's a okay. conditional fee funded. All right, I think. okay, yes. no way, no way. 
as your clients have done, have done enough to, by way of investigation to be able to put forward various suggestions, such as the the assailant was drunk and so on. So there'd that, that, obviously been there'd obviously been some some, some investigations investigation. going on during that period. We just we, we just don't know the extent to which the, the, the claimant was pursuing the claim informally. I, I'm afraid I, I can't assist the court no, that at well, all. Um, we, we know that the defendant was aware of a potential claim because they obviously discovered that the cabin door lock was faulty and they wouldn't have done that unless they, they'd known that there yes. was a claim which related to the cabin door. And they were able to respond, as my Lord has said, in relation yes. to this particular assailant, that he was drunk. Yes, yes. So they knew something about the assailant, yes. although it's not at all clear to me how they knew who he was and whether he was drunk or not, I'm afraid. I, I just can't help with that. <laughs> um, all I can say is that there's a letter of claim, a formal letter of claim, um, issued a year in my mouth. And uh, as I say, I, I, one's not attributing blame on this side of the court in relation to that, save that the upshot of it is that proceedings, for whatever reason, are issued very close to the end of limitation. And there's no criticism of the claimant herself or even of her solicitors in relation to that in the circumstances. You've only got two years under Athens, so it's a truncated period in any event. Um, but what it does mean, even if there is no criticism in relation to issuing at the end of the limitation period, and what the authorities all tell us is that when you do that, you then have to be very, very careful about serving. Because if you issue at the end of limitation, and particularly where there's a non-extendable limitation period, um, you have to be very prudent and very careful and very conscientious about serving. But in fact, what happens here is that no steps are taken to serve the proceedings. That's just, that, I mean, no, sorry, can we just you can, pause, pause you just, there? We, you need to look at it. As it as as it appeared to Miss McKenna, uh, and and the judge seems to have thought that what she should have done was get on with serving on day one in February. What what she in fact did, it appears from the correspondence, was take account of the fact that the rules would have required her to serve the particulars of claim within fourteen days of service, and so she was addressing how to get the particulars of claim in order. Now, do you say that was unreasonable in February or in March? Um, there obviously comes a point when it is unreasonable. But what do you say that point is? April. The because point... in April, it, it was then foreseeable that there might not be enough time left, do you say? By the time we get to April 2020, um, the pandemic is by that point in full swing and uh, any delays that might be caused by that are then foreseeable. But we, we, know, we, we know with the benefit of hindsight that actually from the evidence we've had from the bailiff's department subsequently and from what she was told in the three weeks that she ultimately had, that three weeks shouldn't have been a problem. Even, even in, even in the, the, the COVID circumstances. So why do you say it should have been foreseen as being a problem in, in April? Uh, partly because the claim form was going to expire in August, 14th of August. Yes. And when you get to August in France, serving is a problem. Well, wait, hold on, hold on. Well, that's, that's what the judge said. He seems to yes. have taken judicial notice of that. Was there any evidence for that? Um, there was no evidence before the court for that, save that, actually, that save for the problem that it actually was, which was that everyone went on holiday in France in August. But even, well, but even Mr Warburton said on the 23rd of July, no problem, plenty of time. He yes. knew all about the vacation. Yes, that's a peculiarity of it. Well, it's not a peculiarity, it's the evidence. Well, it is. Um, but then Mr Warburton doesn't appear to have been told that serving proceedings was important or a matter of urgency at all. No, he was not. It's right. not he was asked repeatedly and told, you know, can you reassure me? Yes. Can you reassure me? Is it going to be okay? He was but, given the brief details of the background and so forth. So he must have known it was important. But it's not but just his evidence. It's the evidence that also came forward later in the case from the, from the WCA's office, which says, in terms, each... WCA's office is required to have a duty WCA on duty throughout August and 
if one office can't do it, it, there should be no difficulty at all in finding another office to do it. Now, that's, that's what the evidence is, but you say the judge was still right to treat as a matter of judicial notice that there's a problem serving in all this new France. I, and if so, I, on, what, on what basis? I do. And can well, I just add to my Lord's point? The 28th of July, on the 28th of July rather, Mr Warburton emails Ms McKenna saying he should mention that activity is slower and there's the pandemic. Uh, and she says on the 29th of July, well, can you confirm that you're satisfied there's sufficient time? And he says yes. Even though it's slower, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, that there, we, there's one standing by who's a little out of area um, but who can get the job done in time. So uh, on the basis of all uh, the points my Lord has put to you and that evidence, do you say the judge was entitled, nevertheless, to say there wasn't time? Well, the following email, I, I do, because the following email, it, it then takes us, um, a, a, and we're at page 28, yeah. um, clearly at, at paragraph 14 of the judgment, and there is a criticism there for leaving it Six days, six days, which wouldn't normally be a problem unless you've left it three weeks before you need to serve. So as many as six days later, in a context where attempts to serve have been left until the last three weeks, so a third of the period. But that that's not Miss McKenna. Serve. That's Mr. Warburton who waits six days, no doubt, because he's making investigations. Well, it's both of them because she doesn't then follow up, and she doesn't hear from him for another six days, and she has left it three weeks before. Uh, She's left herself with three weeks of time in which to serve. She then allows um, Mr. Warburton to, uh, to email her, say, I'll get back to you early next week with the fees, etc. Then she leaves it six days. So she leaves it practically a week until she hears from him again. So she doesn't chase him during that period. She's only got three weeks, or she's only got three weeks from the time that the, the, the clock starts ticking for her. And he says, well, I'm sorry to tell you that all our efforts have come to nothing. And what there isn't there, as the judge found, is any indication of urgency about it. Well, why should there be any urgency? She's already been told that there's, there's not going to be a problem. But why, it, why, why, why should she? It, the all, these things are, all these things involve a cost. All these things involve a cost in what is not a huge claim and, and which the recoverability of costs will no doubt be challenged on an assessment if the claim is successful. It, it's but, not, it, we're, we're not talking about circumstances in which she can be expected just to just to incur costs on behalf of her client, for for, for no good reason. Well, I would know because so sending a chasing letter is not a cost-free option. It's not, but if there's no when... reason to do it, there is a reason not to do it, i.e., to incur the costs. Uh, my lord, yes, but the service of proceedings outside the limitation period or at all is such an important matter where if you have left it until um, the last three weeks that, of the time that you've got to do it out of six months well, is that, such an important matter. The, 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 the premise of everything you're saying is that leaving it until the last three weeks was unreasonable because it was foreseeable that three weeks wouldn't be enough. And I, I just wonder what the basis for that is. Why, why was it foreseeable that three weeks wouldn't be enough? Because the reason you have two extra months to serve proceedings, you have six months rather than four on a foreign defendant, is that it's acknowledged that it takes longer, it's more difficult. But on the facts here, and the evidence available, that, that understanding that three weeks would be enough was entirely reasonable, wasn't it, until the 4th of August email? In my submission, no, my lady, because... All sorts of difficulties can arise if you only. No, but you've gone to a specialist. You've gone to Portsea, who are presumably specialist foreign service agents, and unequivocal answers given to very clear questions on the facts here. Well, he does warn on the twenty eighth of July that official administrative and judicial activity is slower than usual, and that is why she follows it up on the 29th. Yes, and says, "Can you confirm? You are satisfied." There is sufficient time. And his response that day is, yes, I expect we can get the job done in time. Well, yes. 
he he says, as I expect, as indicated below, there being a little slow to respond. And that really ought to ring alarm bells in my submission. However, I had have one standing by who's a little out of the area, so we can get the job done in time. So no, so that's important. So yes. he says the, the local ones are being a bit a little bit slow. That may not be an, an, a final problem, but if it is, I've got somebody a little out of area. Why shouldn't she have been reassured by that? And as my lord said, not expend unnecessary cost in chasing and um, anticipate and assume that it's going to be done. Well, she's been warned that he's got to go out of area and she doesn't then go back to him and say, well, what are the implications of that? Will it take longer? Will it cost more? And Because he, he said, said we can get the job done in time. Well, maybe he could have got the job done in time. Well, he said we can. Yes. That's the evidence. And he could have done, using the one that's out of area, had he been properly instructed by her that this was a matter which was important, and it was important that it was done by the uh, expiry of the claim form, and that that was something that was a matter of urgency she, by that point. Sorry, she, she'd made it clear that uh, it had to be done by the 14th of August, hadn't she? Because... Um, she, she had told him of the deadline, yeah. but what she doesn't say to him at any point is, this is a non-negotiable deadline, we need to meet this, and therefore, if, for example, somebody quotes you for £2,000, come back to me and tell me about that, and but, ask me. Um, and what he does is to take on himself the burden of saying, well, it's cost £2,000, and therefore I've rejected it on your behalf. Yeah. She then doesn't go back to him and say, no, wait, hang on a minute, we really need to do this. But, isn't, but she, what she does instead is she makes a judgment call, and it might be said many would do the same, which is to say, in these circumstances, surely the sensible thing is to get an extension of time. Well, my lady... So she had two options, didn't she? she either, yeah, yeah. either pay the 2,000 or make an application, and she chose the latter. And pay the 2,000 in circumstances where she may never recover it, and that's just the beginning of the cost, may not be the end of it. Well, she would have recovered it. Would she? Really? As part really? Of, yes. As part those, of those part of wouldn't it. have challenged them. The, the, the colossal the, sum. The reasonableness of that amount? In a well, claim this size? In the circumstances, it's a, the claim by that point has um, grown to between 50 and £100,000. So it's between 2 and 4% of the... 15 and 50, isn't it? It starts off at 15 to 50. It, it is then amended. To oh, yes. 50 to 50. Yeah. yeah. So it's between fifty and hundred thousand pounds. The defendant is uh, has not nominated solicitors within the jurisdiction. It would be in the in the context of this correspondence. I would venture to suggest it'd be quite difficult. I don't to understand defendant. really why it's in, it was in your client's interest to make all this fuss. I mean, was there any evidence about? Because if, if you're right, the claim is good. Um, if you're sorry, if the claim is good, then um, your your client goes down for more. Yes, it would do. But um, not was there any probing yes. as, as to why the four requests uh, made of, of tozers as to whether or not they had instructions to accept service? Was there any evidence on that? Why there was no response? There was no evidence on that. But well, why was there no response? In, uh, in, in, is, the, is the failure to respond consistent with the overriding objective? Uh, I don't know the answer to why there was no response, but the defendant is entitled to be served. Um, in France and asked to be served in France. But why not but respond? Also, yes, why not? As why I'm, not asking about, I'm asking you about why, 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 why was there no prompt response saying, no, we're not, we're not instructed to accept service, you will have to serve in France. I don't know the answer to that. It, it may be, and the only reason that I can speculate, this is speculation, is that there are no instructions. Um, I, I simply don't know the answer to it. Yeah, it's a that's in entirely fair, but of course it does feed into the three-week delay, doesn't it? The, 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 the fact that it got that far, because uh, as my Lord says, it, it might be said some people in Miss McKenna's shoes would indeed have thought it's nonsense for them not to accept service, I'll just wait on. I, I've now given them the particulars of claim, I've given them a med medical report and draft. Makes no sense. I don't want to spend the money going off to France unless I absolutely have to. What, so holding out, for, holding out for an answer. Had the, and had there been a response right up front saying, no, you are going to have to serve in France, uh, then it might not have been left till three weeks before. Of course, there is no duty on the defendant to make it easy. There is a duty to cooperate, though, under the overriding objective. 
There is, but not to make service easier than uh, it would otherwise be. But, the, but, but what you're being asked about is the, the failure to respond. No. You don't, For over we, six weeks. We, t we quite accept that they didn't have to accept service. But on the 11th or the 10th of June, uh, they could have responded and said, sorry, you're going to have to serve out. They could have done. And should have done. I wouldn't go as far as that. Uh, your ladyship may uh, draw that conclusion. Um, I am not in a position no. uh, to do so, nor am I in a position to explain why it wasn't done. No. What I can, though, do is to say that by reference to the authorities, and, and in particular the good law um, authority, um, that defendants are not under a duty to make it easier than it would otherwise be for claimants to serve on them. No, I but as my lady it. said, they're under a duty to cooperate under the overriding objective. I appreciate that. Is and cooperating includes responding courteously and promptly to correspondence, doesn't it? I, I simply don't know. I don't, I, I don't know why there was no response to that. So I can't the, the, the judge seems to have thought that no steps were taken to try and affect service prior to the 23rd of July. But would it be right to characterise the invitation to the solicitors to accept service as an attempt to serve? Well, it's not really an attempt to serve. It's Why an not? exploratory, um, preparatory exploration prior well, to attempting to serve. It's, it's obviously, it would, it would have been desirable in terms of saving a great deal of costs, if not an enormous claim not to have to go through the green world of serving in France. So it was sensible, was it not, of Ms McKenna to ask whether a company that runs ferries in and out of this country was prepared to accept service. Uh, and that was an attempt to effect service, wasn't it? Um, I would not characterise it in that way. Right, but does, does, let me put it another way. Was it fair for the judge to criticise Ms McKenna for not having taken any relevant steps to affect service prior to the 23rd of July. Yes, because she didn't. It, it, all she knew prior to the 23rd of July was that there was a need for her to serve the defendant abroad. And no, she had no, no. She, she didn't know there was a need for that. She knew there was a need to serve the defendant. She might have thought uh, if, if these defendants weren't going to going to take technical points that they would agree to accept service. They had English solicitors on the record, they run ferries in the of England. Uh, you're entirely right that they were entitled to refuse to accept service, but uh, equally she, she, she might reasonably have thought that they might accept service, and so she asked them. Now, do, do, you, do you say that's an unreasonable stance for her to have taken and to have waited at least a reasonable time to get a response? I say that it's unreasonable to assume that a foreign defendant will accept service within this jurisdiction when the presumption is that they will not. That, that may be so, but equally, it's reasonable, isn't it, not to go about serving in France until you've had an answer? It's reasonable to ask the question before, yes, that, you, before you take um, costly steps. Yes. And, to, and to wait for the answer. And to wait a reasonable period of time for the answer. Right. However, um, the... Letter of claim was sent in December 2019, which the claimant solicitors was aware was towards the end of the limitation period. And if one were to make preparatory, exploratory steps towards serving, that would have been a good time to do it, rather than waiting until after the claim form had been issued. So I concede that it is a preparatory, exploratory step, as opposed to an attempt to serve. But I assert that it's something that could have been done earlier, and that having issued the claim form, the assumption ought to be on the part of a reasonable solicitor that the defendant will stand on its rights and will have to be served in the place of its registration or domicile. Ms. Preview, could you remind me where in the judgment the judge says that no steps were taken? My Lord's just referred to it, and I'm, I'm at fault. I can't find it. Sorry. Um, maybe my Lord can help me. It's, it's, it's first of all in ground one. Thank you. It's paragraph, so it's pa page, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. It's page 27, it's paragraph um, nine. Nine, yes. 
So Josh says, there is, however, no evidence as to why A, nothing had been done in respect of service by then, both generally and particularly bearing in mind that proceedings had been issued and were very shortly before the expiry of the Because nothing had been done in respect of service. You, nothing you, you, you agree was done, done for two, two months, months thereafter. Yeah. And so that, that doesn't stand, does it? Well, he's referring to uh, early April 2020, looking at paragraph 8. So he's talking about the evidence for, of Rachel McKenna mm -hmm. in her witness statement. And she says, referring to early April 2020, which is uh, two months after issue, that she was conscious that court proceedings needed to be served. And I think it's at that time that she sends a letter. So that's my April 2020, you need to start worrying now, zone. Or start attempting to serve now. Because the rule that you've got six months to serve proceeding outside the jurisdiction, rather than four months to serve within the jurisdiction, gives you an additional two months. And if you fritter those two months by not doing anything, that in my submission... Uh, asking for trouble. You can't keep saying not doing anything though, can you? Well, she didn't do anything for two months and then she started to ask about um, service. And it's not until... Well, again, she, it's, well, it's again you say she yes. didn't do anything for two months, but, but it, it's clear uh, from the correspondence itself that she had in mind that what she needed to be doing was putting herself in a position to be able to serve her particulars of claim within 14 days of service. And that and she could not have done that without the medical evidence. Now, what's well, unreasonable about that? That's the issue with that, my lady. The reason being that the particulars of claim only needed to say, um, this is the booking, this is the carriage, the Athens <coughs> Convention applies to it, this is what happened, this is why uh, the Athens Convention is engaged, i.e. there was a fault in the ship, or there was uh, a defect in the ship, or there was a fault on the part of the crew. And... Um, particulars of injury, which would involve the date of birth and the particulars of what the claimant said the consequences were. But how could she give particulars of the such psychological trauma or uh, injury without a medical report that set that out? Well, she would have give been assertion of, of what she. You don't need to plead evidence in no. claim, and she could. She could have. Quite easily, and one sees it done often and often, particularly with Brexit um, and all the particulars of claim that needed to be um, pleaded at Brexit time with no medical evidence at all. Um, but it was pleaded that the claimant has suffered psychological reaction as a result of this incident and is in the process of obtaining medical evidence. Could you just remember? remind me of that because I, I, it's yes, been a while sorry. since I've looked at this. Isn't there a pre? Isn't there a personal injury protocol which there, says you should serve? Or, or is there a practice direction that deals with this? That I always thought you had to serve a medical report did. alongside. You ought to serve any medical evidence on which you intend to rely yes. alongside your particular claim. And which rule is that, please? Uh, that, thank you very much. I know, it's bread and butter for you, but it's well, jam for me or something. My learned friend is very helpful in thank you. Um, providing me with the jam um, which I require. <laughs> Um, it's uh, the practice direction to CPR 16, and it's uh, paragraph 4.1 tells us what the particulars of claim have to contain. So, claimant's date of birth, which she could do, and brief details of the claimant's personal injuries, which she could also do. The claimant must attach to this particulars of claim a schedule of details of any past and future. I'm sorry, it's page 610 of Thank the white book. Sorry, I should have said that. No, don't worry. So, six of one of those past and future, I think, right? yeah, no, must, must attach to or serve. So, you've got to have date of birth, mm -hmm. you've got to have your personal injuries, which I, I say she could have done because she knows what her psychological response is. Schedule of details of past and future expenses, there's no suggestion that that couldn't have been done. And then, this is the, the part that um, your ladyship was, was talking about, paragraph 4.3. Where the claimant's relying on the evidence of a medical practitioner, the claimant must attach to or serve with his particulars of claim a report from a medical practitioner about the personal injuries which he alleges in his claim. And so you should do that, but there is a case, must. There is a case <laughs> whose name escapes me, but Malena Jr. has just passed me post-it notes. Thank you. Uh, Mark and University Coatings and Service. Yes? Uh, Mark and University Coatings. This is a case which says if you don't do that, it's not a defect or it is remediable. So if you don't 
of medical evidence, it is not, that is not generally sufficient grounds with which to strike out a claim. And quite frequently... Not generally, it's <laughs> pretty well, risky. It, I mean, we're, we're, in, we're talking about the reasonableness or otherwise. Was it reasonable for Ms McKenna, in light of PD 4.3, to conclude that until I have a medical report, I can't serve the particulars of claim, and therefore I don't want to start the 14-day period running until I'm in a position to do that? to no. get on with that. You say that was not reasonable. That's not reasonable in my submission because one often and often sees it done that uh, if there is a, a reason why proceedings have had to be issued and or served without a medical report, as I say, the Brexit, the, the huge avalanche of Brexit proceedings that we saw immediately prior to Exit Day is a, a, a very recent example of it. Well, actually, the COVID pandemic is also an example of it, where people couldn't get medical appointments, so they serve particular claim without medical reports. And that's something that the courts have been perfectly happy to uh, allow, um, because there is a good reason as to why. It just depends. Yeah, it? It, it depends, depends on, on the context. It depends on whether or not you, are, you reasonably think you've got time enough to, to get the medical report before serving. Uh, and here... Um, whether or not the anticipation was that Brittany Ferries would instruct their solicitors to accept, accept service in England, or because three weeks in, in due course was thought to be enough. It's all in context, isn't it? It is, and it's all it's balancing risks. Yeah. But yeah. what the claimant solicitor does at every step is to consider the risk, falling in favour of not serving not informing the defendant uh, that there is a case which it will have to meet because by that point um, the limitation period has expired and she does um, provide a claim form but not serve, specifically says I'm not serving this on you for the purposes that, that we've discussed. Um, but that claim form is different to the claim form that is ultimately served because it limits the value of the claim to £15,000. I mean, I'm conscious we're taking you away from answering Mr Mooney's points, but again, just looking at context, Mr the Tozer gentleman was saying, please, please, please give me, give me the particulars of claim, please, please give me the medical expert report, both of which were provided. His words were, because it's integral to, integral to an assessment of liability, um, settlement was not out of the question, was it? There's nothing. Anyway, it, it's, that, it's, that, yeah. it's just the overall picture of what was what was going on here. There's nothing to indicate it was out of the question, but there's also, also nothing to indicate that it was happening. No, I understand, because... but just the whole. Yes. All right. Thank you. The authority to which I was. Um, referring the court was the Cecil and Byatt case, which we say is relevant for our purposes. Um, it's page 87 of the authorities bundle. And this is to do with issues of finance and issues of costs. And the respondent's submission is that it would have been, these costs of serving would have been recoverable in circumstances in which the defendant required, or at least did not exclude, the service. Is that it. right? Wouldn't the defendant have come along and said, it only costs 2,000 because you left it so late, and had you... Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> had, you, had you made these efforts earlier, there'd have been an in-area, we're not going to pay more than 48 euros. I can't answer that question, obviously. Well, that's, that's, the that's the logical obvious. consequence of the submissions you're making to <laughs> yeah. us today. Yeah. Well, it's better to take the risk of that what? than to take the risk of not serving. Well, in my submission. That's more reasonable. Of seeking a pros prospective extension. Uh, extension of time, which, if rejected, could then be reacted to in time. And, and yes. uh, Miss uh, Prager, Cecil and Byatt, as paragraph 98 on the page after the page that you've just referred to us, was commercial litigation on a grand scale. We're not, we're not in that world. This is a 
a personal injury claim where psychological injuries have been suffered. It's a relatively modest claim, albeit probably for um, the claimant a, a substantial claim. And in context, £2,000 was, as Mr Warburton himself described, a colossal sum. It would have come out of the claimant's damages, potentially. Well, in my submission, no. Um, it, it would never have come out of the claimant's damages because either the defendant would have been ordered to pay it or the claimant's solicitors would have had to bear it because right. the only way that the defendant wouldn't have been ordered to, to bear it would have been if a finding had been made that it was due to the claimant's solicitor's fault. So it well, could never have come out well, of the claimant's damages. Well, I'm not... Yeah, anyway, all right. Even assuming that the funding arrangements... Um, that are made and about which I know very little, obviously. All right, well, that's one difference. And then the other difference, as my Lord said, is that the uh, suggestion that there was that, that there was no financial capacity to serve uh, in Cecil and Byer was rejected. And what was said is that they should have served and then stayed the proceedings in order to sort out the funding arrangements. Well, as here, there was financial capacity. It was possible to serve in, in both cases both here and in Cecil and Byron. If I can just take yeah. um, the to paragraph uh, 97 of that judgment, which is on page 87, whether there's any support for the claimant's submission that funding difficulties, or rather a desire that funding be in place, so as to eliminate or minimise risk to the claimants, which is where we are here, can be a good reason for the deliberate decision to delay service of the claim. And that's where I say we are that trying to eliminate or minimise risk uh, to the claimant is said in this case to be a good reason for the deliberate decision to delay service, or, or in this case not go right down that particular service route, thereby necessitating, necessitating an extension from the court of time within which to serve. And I say that we that, that is exactly where we are, that the claimant solicitors took a decision so as to eliminate risk for their clients and that decision, a deliberate decision, did lead to the uh, delay of service and then did in turn necessitate an extension of time. And Sorry, the decision to eliminate risk, where was that taken here? So this is the, the decision not to pay over £2,000 because there was a risk they wouldn't get it back. So that's, that's not a decision to eliminate risk, that's a decision to do something else. Well, it's a decision to eliminate the risk that you might not be paid back the £2,000. And that decision meant that the claim form could not be served in time, and that meant that they had to get an extension. And the court in Cecil and Byatt holds, there's nothing in the jurisprudence to support that submission, even in the absence of a problem with limitation. And the position is still more difficult in its presence as here. And in the absence of authority, I look at the proposition as a matter of principle. I would subscribe to the cautionary view of never saying never. It's possible that an impecunious claimant who has acted timiously to obtain legal aid and is delayed for an answer for reasons which are not within his or her control, which is not where we are here, and only needs a short extension to enable aid and thus representation to be secured, might come within Rule 7.62, but that is not this case. But doesn't that emphasise that these are all uh, decisions on their facts, that the context is critical, and... Um, whilst a different master might have taken the view you're taking and taken the view of the judge, uh, it's not possible to say that it's wrong or out with the band of reasonable uh, decisions uh, to come to the opposite view. Well, my lady, it's, it's not quite that. It's a question of never say never. There might be cases on the outsides of the outreaches yeah. of this but generally speaking, um, it will not be a good reason. And we say that we are within that band as opposed to at the very outside of the band where, for example, there are delays in legal aid or something of that nature where it's just impossible. Well, that just emphasises the, the fact that this is all about a, 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 an evaluative uh, discretion, a judgment, weight being attached to different factors. No, because in Cecil and Byer, the, what the court is saying there is I'm, I'm not going to say this can never happen but it really isn't a good reason unless something there's some feature about it which takes it out of the generality and in this case there's no feature about this case which takes it out of the generality we say okay. 
and then and we say limitation does feed into that and this is at page 92 and paragraph 108 Where, and I accept that limitation is mentioned um, by the master below, but the reality we say is that he didn't really take it into account. And paragraph 108, finally on the, the question of extension of time for service, but of prime importance, there's the way in which the judge considered the limitation aspect of the case. In considering whether good reason had been shown, he failed to take limitation into account at all, and only brought limitation into account when he considered the balance of hardship which he argued from strongly favoured the granting of the extension. And he goes on to say, D, the loss of a claimant's claim by reason of limitation is likely to be a barren excuse, unless, as I would accept, he's prevented from serving in time or some other good reason which takes account of limitation has been shown. The judge next entirely discounted the loss of limitation defence which the defendants achieve in such a case in the absence of an extension of time. First on the ground that a short further delay in prosecution of the claim caused little prejudice, and secondly on the ground the defendants could not assume they were protected by limitation until six years and six months after the origin of the cause of action. It goes on to say... Well, what's the point? Please. What's the, what's the point you do? What's the proposition from this paragraph? It's that the good reason has to impact on the limitation period at, at the bottom of G. Right. So it's that, that highlighted section. And then in... Therefore, for the claim to show that his good reason... I mean, really, it's over the page at B that in a limitation case, a claimant sh must show a provisionally good reason for an extension of time, which properly takes on yeah. board the significance yes. of limitation. It's really that. Yes. Right. And um, and of course, we uh, and the court has my submissions with regard to the goodness of the reason if I consider them in that way. In Kosravi, which is the following um, authority in the bundle. Yes, and so reading that paragraph, my earlier comments to you were misplaced. If this is to be taken at face value, there is an overlap between yes. between the significance of limitation and the good reason. Yes. Yes, thank you. Because it has to be seen in the context. Of yeah, the I think we agree with that, but yes. no difficulty with that. Following authority is Kasrabi. I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. Um, it's a High Court case, but it's quite useful in setting out the, in a pithier way than perhaps I do in my skeleton, um, the relevant factors here. It's page 104. 104 sorry. So, paragraph 39 uh, refers to. Shrewd in Hodmark. While it has naturally been recognised that the litigant can establish a good reason where he has been unable to serve despite his best efforts, it seems clear that the court will not generally recognise mere lack of funding as a reason, and then there's reference to Cecil and Byron. And I say that, that that is where we are here. The suggestion that not spending £2,000 in order to eliminate risk is not capable of being a good reason on, on the authorities, I say. 40. The other basis advanced was that time was needed to gather further evidence, which is the medical report point. This might have justified the seeking of a stay at an inter-parties hearing once the proceedings were launched on the basis of evidence already obtained, but it's hard to see how it would be a reasonable ground for holding up service of the claim form for nearly 18 months. Now, in this case, of course, service of the claim, claim form wasn't effective for 10 months after issue, so it's not as long a period, but nevertheless. I was invited to err on the side of generosity, having particular regard to the stress and poor health with which the claimant has had to contend in recent years. On the other hand, the defendants too are entitled to consideration of fair treatment in the litigation process. The longer the case is allowed to drag on, the greater the time and expenditure they will have to devote to it, with little prospect of recovering their costs if ultimately successful. And that, of course, is the case that we're in here as well. They're entitled not only to clarity in the formulation of the claim, but also to be able to see at least the prospect of light at the end of the tunnel. This is especially so where the claim in question depends upon events to have taken place many years ago. 
And then just finally, in relation to this authority, um, paragraph 43, the overriding... What about 42? Sorry. Sometimes where a claim is difficult to already be seen as attributable to wrongdoing on the part of the defendant, as often happens in personal injury or clinical negligence cases, it may be appropriate for the court to show a degree of forbearance if a claimant has to overcome hurdles in coping with litigation and consequence. This is not a case of, for example, a brain injury claimant who's having difficulties in giving instructions or a claimant who um, doesn't attend medical appointments for reasons connected with a psychological injury. There's no evidence that this claimant for any reason connected with um, the incident or connected with her response to the incident has any difficulties which would have led to any delay. There's no suggestion at all on the part of either the appellant or the respondent that the delays originate with the claimant herself, either as a result of this incident or otherwise. So we're, we're not there. There may be circumstances in which a defendant should not be permitted to take unfair or tactical advantage of its own wrongdoing. And that, in my submission, would be one of those cases at the outer sides of discretion, where um, if a defendant, for example, um, prevaricates in some way about where it is to be served or um, attempts to cover up some kind of uh, issue, you know, having moved or something of that nature, uh, in disaster to provide a new address or something of that nature, where a defendant fails to do so, that might be. Might it be suggested that by not answering the repeated requests as to whether you'd be prepared to accept service, not you, Tozers, that that was taking some tactical advantage? Um, it, 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 might, it might reasonably be argued that it was an attempt to take a tactical advantage, but certainly not a wrongdoing. There's no wrongdoing in not nominating solicitors within or, or even in not answering a letter that's not in my firm submission wrongdoing of any kind um and and i, I can take that point relatively briefly now if you would like me to with reference to the good law project case um whereas you will recall um, that was a, to do with e-filing and there was a problem with e-filing um, and the defendant had not uh, cooperated terribly with the claimant in, in service of the claim. It's the last authority in the bundle at page 198. Uh, and this paragraph, if I start at paragraph 41 at the, at the bottom of that, the need for particular care in effecting valid service, particularly where there are tight time limits and or claimant is operating towards the end of any relevant limitation period, is self-evident. So any reasonable solicitor would uh, take uh, particular care in effecting valid service. I'm so sorry, it's my fault. Which paragraph are we on? I'm so sorry. It's um, page 198D. It's paragraph 41 at the end. Thank you. I think the had the service had been at the right place but in the wrong format. It should have been sent as a sent as a letter, but to the same person ultimately. Yes. Whereas it was sent it, by email. Yes. I can't remember the details. It, it, was, it was. My lady will remember them better than I do. My lady's not saying anything. Right? Yes. <laughs> um, but what was the point you're making? Yeah. Well, you need to take particular care where you are operating towards the end of a relevant well, limitation. Well, that's, 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 that's common sense, isn't it? Of course it is. But that's that's not what the um, claimant solicitor does. But then further on... Well, how is that? Well, we've been there. OK. Further on at page 200. And this is 200D. It's paragraph 57. Yeah, well, that, that's again a completely different point with respect. This is not. Well, well you said anyway. You said we, we we all agree no positive no positive obligation to give positive assistance. It's not quite the same as failing to cooperate, um, repeated or by failing to answer repeated questions, straightforward questions about service. Is it? It's not, but it's simply an answer to the point that it might be wrongdoing. My lady's right, point. I, I, I didn't say it might be wrongdoing. I said oh. tactical advantage. Well, the uh, which I've noted you as accepting. Which you accepted, yes. Well, Kosravi um, <laughs> is, is it Kosravi? I was looking at. I can't remember now. Yes, um, it was. Was to do with taking tactical advantage of the defendant's wrongdoing, and it might be taking tactical advantage, but it isn't wrongdoing. 
not to answer a letter and it's not wrongdoing not to nominate solicitors within the jurisdiction and it's not wrongdoing to stand on your right to be served in a foreign country. No, we agree. So, for all of those reasons, we say that the authorities uh, show and should have led the claimant solicitor to believe that either gathering evidence such as the uh, medical report or concerns around eliminating risk around funding should not be taken to be a good reason for not serving the claim form. And actually gathering evidence isn't even a good enough reason not to serve the particulars of claim. But far less, we say, should it be seen as being a good reason not to serve the claim form itself, but because there is a distinction. Can I just, just you, you say that the decision not to press Portsea to pay the 2000 can be equated with a decision to wait in order to eliminate risk by choosing not to pay. Yes. All right. Because, and my lady mentioned earlier in response to the learned friend that the judgment of Mr. Andrew Baker does refer to choice. And choice is crucial in this case in my submission because the only reason that the defendant has been served with these proceedings 10 months uh, after issue, which equates to al almost putting 50% on the limitation period, because it's only a two-year limitation period, the only reason why that has happened is choices made, not foisted upon them, but made by the claimant solicitors. Mm -hmm. And in my submission, those choices do not amount to good reasons for these purposes and bearing in mind the context which is that the choices were made after limitation and when a goodly time had already expired having issued and it's as a result of the choices made by the claimant solicitors that the defendant has been deprived of limitation defence in circumstances in which the Athens Convention limitation period is strict and not extendable. So what the defendant solicitor has done is to award herself a 10-month extension no, she of hasn't. time. No, she hasn't. She had six months. It's not, it's not fair to look at the um, February or the March 2020 date, which is when limitation period expired because there was always a six-month period in which it could be served. So it's two or three months, four months. That's four months. Yeah. In circumstances in which limitation is not extendable. Sorry, I missed that. In circumstances in which limitation is not extendable, no. because the limitation period under Athens is not yeah. extendable. That's actually quite a complicated question, but in broad terms it's not extendable. Well, it wouldn't be extendable in this case. Other than by agreement? Other than by agreement... Um, in writing, which mm -hmm. did not exist. So I say that is a relevant consideration, even more relevant than in your usual Section 33 type situation, in your usual personal injury situation, where there might be an extension of time. Here, there never would be in, in this particular case. And I, I take your lordship's point. So the respondent's case on this is that the judge, Mr. Andrew Baker, was correct, both in his approach, which he set out. He turned his mind to these issues. He turned his mind to the discretion point. He correctly rehearsed the facts. Uh, and uh, you see in the judgment where, where he is critical of the claimant solicitors, both in terms of their general approach and general response says lack of urgency about this. And he is critical of the claimant solicitors in the failure to make material disclosure. And 
he directs himself properly as to his approach, he directs himself properly as to the authorities, and he directs himself properly as to the law. And in those circumstances, the respondent says that there is simply no reason to disturb the conclusion that he comes to. May I turn my back? Yes, please. Any questions for me? We don't. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Ms. Prager. Mr. Mooney, anything in reply? Unless my ladies or my lord have anything for me, I don't think there's anything to do with. Well, do you want to say anything about Cecil? Well, well simply this about um, Cecil and Byers. It, it appears the submission that's being put forward by Ms. Prager is effectively financial, financial constraints or financial issues, to put it more widely, can never be good reason. Well, in my um, submissions at the outset, I, I gave the perhaps extreme example of the £10,000 fee being charged. There has to be a point at which it, it is reasonable for a judge or for a solicitor in that position to say, I can't pay that, 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 is, that is a now, ridiculous amount of money to pay. And when you reduce it to how much, you reduce it to judgment and you reduce it to a matter of discretion. And you made that submission, that's... Yeah, so that's your that's your That's how I deal with yeah. And the moment you get to that point, that's 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 where you are. Well thank you very much um, to to both uh, council and those sitting behind you. Um, we will reserve judgment in this case. Our judgments will come out in the usual way um, for you to um, look at them for the purposes of uh, typographical errors and that sort of thing, but not to make further submissions. And can I emphasize the importance of the uh, confidentiality warning uh, in the rubric at the top of the draft judgments that will come out? Uh, they are sent to council for the purposes of correcting typographical errors and the like, and not for uh, the preparation of um, press releases or anything of the kind. I suspect that that's not likely in this case, but just to emphasize that point, because it has been overlooked in cases in the last um, few months. Yes, um, just in case we are able to get our judgments out in the uh, next week or so, uh, are council around in early August to deal with typographical errors? or will that be something uh, it, that, that where arrangements can be made? As far as I'm concerned, I, I can certainly look at it. I'm sure Ms Nelson would be happy to help me. <laughs> Ms Prager, <laughs> are you in the same position or is it going to be more difficult? I think I speak for my junior as well, yeah. saying that he's always available. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we, yes. We, we may not manage it. We hope we will, but um, I, I, if we can manage it, you, you will be able to make it. Between us, I'm sure we will. That's extremely helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.